thank you all for coming. Uh, this is probably a sort of personal perspective on things. I'm sick of talking about a change in climate for coral reefs. I would really like to talk about a changed climate for coral reefs because then we would know where we stand and what we have to deal with. But unfortunately, the climate is continuing to change. So I'm going to talk briefly about how the climate is changing, why corals are sensitive, give you some ideas of the historical perspectives we can get from annual uh, massive corals, look at the recent bleaching events and talk about options for a future for coral reefs. And if we go back, this is only about 250 years, there was an intersection in time between the Great Barrier Reef and the Industrial Revolution. James Want patented the improved steam engine and that required more coal, which was very accessible in the part of the world he came from, which is the same part of England as I did. And 1770, Dosef Banks, serving with James Cook, gave an early descri European description of how spectacular the Great Barrier Reef is. If we're talking about climate, it's all about energy from the sun and also the particular composition of the atmosphere. If we didn't have the atmosphere, we wouldn't be here. The Earth would be about 30 degrees Celsius cooler. Climate results from sort of the oceans and the atmosphere trying to move that energy around. So that's why we have regional climates. The notion that humans could interfere with the climate system is not a recent idea. Back at the end of the 19th century, uh, Spente Arenas, who won a Nobel Prize for something else, but did some back-of-the-envelope calculations and reckoned if we kept on burning coal and produced carbon dioxide, which they called carbon, carbonic acid in those days, then the Arctic would heat up considerably. At that time, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was 290 parts per million. So just to demonstrate how really old I am. The, f <laughs> the first paper I published uh, on climate change and climate impacts, importantly, was in 1983. And as we said there, one of the unexpected results is the possibility that winters over Europe could actually get colder in a warmer world and more extreme. And those pictures along the bottom are from 2018 in various parts of Europe. What's also interesting is who actually funded that research 35 years ago, and it was an oil <laughs> company and the US Department of Energy. Again, going back to 1983, that was the first report of mass coral bleaching in a paper published by Peter Glynn in 1984 in, off the Pacific coast, uh, the Panama of, uh, in the Eastern Pacific. So within 35 years, the amount of carbon dioxide has increased by 63 parts per million, global temperatures by about half a degree Celsius, and reef temperatures by about 0.4 degrees Celsius. So climate has changed in the past. Why are we so sure it's due to human activities? Well, we have theory, modelling, and evidence from a range of sources. And if we look at... This was the global temperature series when I wrote that paper in 1983. And this is based on air temperatures over land and sea surface temperatures measured in the oceans. That's what's happened to that over my research lifetime. So, and the amount of global warming to 2017 from pre-industrial times is nearly one degree Celsius. 18 of the warmest years on record have all occurred in the past 20 years, with 2016 the warmest. And the reason for that is increasing greenhouse gases. The record at Mauna Loa, the observational record of greenhouse gases, started in the late 1950s. And again, that's what has happened to it over my research lifetime. In red there, we actually have the amount of carbon dioxide measured at the Ames Cape Ferguson site. And we've reached 4,406 parts per million in 2017. And the latest IPCC report concluded that the human influence on the climate system is now clear. We can put this into a much longer term perspective when they look at air bubbles and ice cores. And again, we see 
changes over time and then this rapid increase basically since the 1950s. We see evidence for changes associated with rising global sea level. The oceans are getting warmer, they're expanding and ultimately land-based ice will melt and increase the rate of sea level rise. It's basically been about 20 centimetres since the 19th century but the rate is currently accelerating. We also have evidence for polar regions with the thinning and uh, reduction in the amount of Arctic sea ice. This is totally changing the Arctic. People lost their lives in the 19th century searching for the Northwest Passage. Last year you could have gone on the biggest exp expedition to the Arctic if you could pay 22,000 US dollars and sail through the Northwest Passage. And there's also evidence from biological systems. This is one from a publication in 2009, but it just illustrates the mismatch between different parts of ecosystems. <coughs> the flowering plants in Greenland are starting to flower earlier. The caribou are still calving at the same time of year, so they're missing out on the fresh plants and the flowers that they eat, resulting in a lot of them starving to death. And unfortunately, it's all due to human activities. Sorry, gone back. So we know it's not easy being a coral reef. You have waves, you have things that want to eat you all the time, good things and bad things, you get coral diseases, you're out in the sun, but the basic thing that you have to do to sustain yourself is to keep calcifying. And if you keep on doing that, then we end up with one of the world's most diverse ecosystems. The top description was Matthew Flinders, who actually gave the Great Barrier Reef its name when he was circumnavigating around Australia. And they really punch above their weight when we look at what they contribute to the world in general. 1994, Clive Wilkinson and Bob Budemeyer published a summary report based on input from scientists around the world, coral reef scientists, and they concluded that the human pressures were far greater immediate threat to coral reefs than the climate change. By that time, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere had got to 359 parts per million. So coral reefs live in very narrow sort of environmental range. It's the warmest parts of the tropical oceans. It also has a narrow thermal range they like particular conditions of the water. And if we compare here in red, we have the distribution of sea surface temperatures for only the coral reef regions, and in blue for the rest of the tropical oceans. So you see it's a fairly uh, concentrated area in which they like to exist. We also know that tropical species are more sensitive to temperature changes. If you're living in a very narrow temperature range, as our tropical coral reefs, it's much easier to shift you out of your comfort zone. Whereas if you're a temperate species, you can move a bit, but you're still within that envelope with which you're used to. So we know global land and sea temperatures are warming, and so are the tropical oceans. 15 of the warmest years have ha occurred since 1988, with 2016 the warmest year. The coral reef the tropical ocean regions don't warm as fast as global temperatures. They warm about 70% of that rate. And there's also spatial variability in the rate of warming. This shows the annual trend in sea surface temperatures from 1880 through 2050. And we see some areas, in particular in the near equatorial Pacific, where the rate of warming is really quite low. But then there's other areas, for example, in the Western Indian Ocean, and also both sides of Australia, where that warming is quite much higher. And we have warming round Australia. This is for the period from 1950 through to 2017. I'm not sure how well it's going to show up, but it's going down the east coast and the west coast in five <coughs> degrees sort of latitudinal bands. And what you take out of this is everywhere is warming, but some areas are warming faster than others. What we have is the maximum temperatures, the annual average, and the minimum temperatures. So different areas are warming at different rates. So there's quite a bit of spatial variability within the system. And what's also happening is that the distribution 
of sea surface temperatures at particular locations is also changing. So this is temperature range, various bins that have put the temperatures in, and the black is the most recent 20-year period, and the dashed line is 1950 to 1969. So a lot of the stuff we talk about is in terms of average temperatures, average maximum, average annual temperatures, but this just illustrates that the whole distribution of the whole environment in which the corals are living is now much different than it was in the past. And we also need to consider that when we're looking at what organism, how organisms might respond to future changes. Another way we can look at this is globally. So what I'm showing here is losses of temperatures within that particular temperature range. So those are in the greens and the blues. And in the oranges and reds is where that temperature range is increasing. And that's between uh, 1950 to 80 and comparing that to 1981 to 2011. So what you can see from that is major losses here in the 26, 27 to 28 degrees range and here in the 28 to 29 and the distribution is shifting much more into that 29 to 30 degrees range, particularly in the sort of Western, Indo -Pacific, Western Pacific, the Indo-Pacific warm core. So we know corals are sensitive to warming and we know the outcome from that is coral bleaching, which is the breakdown in the symbiosis. And we know the recent mass coral bleaching events are a consequence of global warming. And all that has flow-on effects to other reef-associated organisms. Another component of the changing system is that about a third of the extra carbon dioxide we put into the atmosphere has been absorbed by the oceans. And that's making them more acidic. And this is some nice examples of studies Caterina Fabricius at Ames has done a lot of studies at a natural sea at carbon dioxide site at Papua New, in Papua New Guinea. And there are many papers if you're interested uh, in delving in more detail into that. But the basic thing that happens is you end up with reduced coral diversity. You go from a reef with lots of different hard corals to one dominated by parietes, which I quite like because I like, that's what I work with most <laughs> of the time. But, and evidently those parietes there, they can still be growing, but dissolving from underneath, which uh, was an interesting concept. There's, going to be, there's more ma macroalgae uh, near the seep sites. There's fewer coral recruits, which is illustrated down here by these settlement plates. And reef development stops altogether at seven, pH of 7.8. We also know corals are sensitive to tropical cyclones. But these are natural sources of disturbance on many reefs. They've been happening hundreds of thousands of years, but they can have quite devastating consequences. This is as the result of tropical cyclone Debbie. But the reefs need time to recover. What the future might hold is there might be fewer of these big tropical cyclones, but those that do occur are more severe. So more like the Yazis and the Debbies and so forth. So, we know also that corals can recover from disturbance. This is a nice example from the isolated Scott Reef of Western Australia by James Gilmore and his colleagues. They were suffered greatly in the 1998 coral bleaching event with coral cover going down to only 9%. But 12 years later, it was back up to 44% despite of delay in recruitment over that time. So reefs can recover. Unfortunately, these hit reefs were, the Scott Reef was hit again in the 2016 bleaching event. I'm going to shift slightly to introduce some historical perspectives on what's going on in terms of the current changes in the environment. We have all these wonderful means whereby we can measure the marine environment, uh, satellite observations measure sea surface temperatures from space, see flood plumes going out onto the reef. But those records, when you think about them, are relatively short. And one way we can get further back into the past is to use what we call proxy climate records, substitutes for the observational records. So these are systems that are affected by climate, uh, leave a record of that, and most importantly, that record can be dated to individual years. So 
have tree rings, ice cores, sediment layers, and documentary records. These people are standing on the frozen surface of Lake Sua outside Tokyo, and they are worshipping the local god because when the lake freezes over in winter, that's a sign that the local god has arrived. The ice will break up a bit, crack, and that's a sign that the god has wa walked on the lake. They've been measuring, uh, recording the date of the freezing and breakup back to the 15th century. Mm -hmm. Obviously, how fast, how soon or late the ice freezes over depends upon the air temperature. So that's one way you can use documentary records to reconstruct what's gone on in the past. None of those work in the tropical oceans, however. So, which brings us to annual bands in massive corals. These were actually discovered as a result of the American nuclear tests in the 1950s and 60s at Eni Atoll in the Pacific, when a group of scientists went out to see what had happened to the coral reefs apart from being blown up. And they took a slice from a massive coral, a massive parietes co coral, put it on sensitive paper in a dark room for a month, and what they saw was some radioactive bands. One of the scientists, Bob Budemeyer, he was a, a, had a geological background and was used to x-raying uh, rocks and sediment cores and things like that, so they gave the local doctor a few beers and said, would you x-ray our coral slice? And this is a positive print of a medical x-ray of a slice of coral. And what they saw was a series of light bands and dark bands reflecting the density of the coral skeleton. Because they knew when they'd collected the coral, they knew the dates of the nuclear tests that were being recorded in the radioactive bands, they were able to demonstrate that this banding pattern was annual. And that opened up a big opportunity, firstly to look at uh, coral growth rates retrospectively, Prior to that, you might have to go to a shipwreck or bat a nail in a coral and see, come back a few years later. They also saw the potential for uh, reconstructing other aspects of the marine environment from materials trapped in the coral skeleton. So, coral cores. Uh, it's not that easy to get coral cores, so I don't do it at all because I have no practical skills whatsoever. But a team of uh, skilled divers can go out and collect cores, and importantly, after we've taken the core out, we plug the hole with a small concrete plug, and that thin living tissue layer on the outside edge will, in most circumstances, grow back over that in a matter of time. So we're fairly user-friendly. At the simplest level, when we look at uh, x-rays of the corals, these are positive prints of the x-rays, we can just look at events in the coral's life. And this is a coral from Tantabidi of Western Australia, and this is from Pandora on Eastern Australia. This is showing a growth hiatus co corresponding to the 1998 bleaching event. This coral didn't necessarily bleach, but it was stressed enough to disrupt its growth records. And those sorts of disruptions appear only in the modern parts of these coral core records. This reef in uh, Tantabidi, of Western Australia, it had a really boring life. Every year looks exactly the same, till you get to 1998. Now that tells you something, that that, coral's that coral has been really happy in that environment for a couple of hundred years. The only thing it's noticed is something that's happened in modern times. We can also measure how much the corals are calcifying from these, growth, these density bands, and this is what I call my bleeding obvious graph, which is basically coral calcification, annual average sea surface temperature, and all that's saying is corals will calcify more in warmer waters. This is a spatial relationship based on about 40 to 50 sites throughout the Indo-Pacific. We can also use that to say, well, are corals performing as expected at particular reef sites? And noticeably here we have uh, the Hoopman abrolis and Coral Blay of Western Australia where those corals are overachieving and that's possibly something to do with the Lewin current down there. They shouldn't really be growing. If you look at the water temperature there, they should have negative calcification and should not be there. Then you see other sites which are performing that Maijai Reef is in the South China Sea. Something funny is going on in that environment that means that coral's not performing as well as it should be. We can also look at coral growth through time. Uh, there's a paper published by Glenn Diat et al. Uh, 
nearly 10 years ago. And what they saw was an initial increase over the 20th century in how fast the corals were growing, and then a more recent decline. So the initial increase matched how the water temperatures were rising on the Great Barrier Reef, but then it's obviously got to a point where it's not so comfortable. If we look off Western Australia, the main change was in those southerly reefs, the Hootmanabolis, the very cool water reefs where the water temperature has warmed most, actually increased their growth rates over the 20th century, which suggests that the water temperature was a limiting factor and that it's actually initially been able to take advantage of the warmer water temperatures. Unfortunately, I think this series ended about 2009, 2011, a lot of the reefs sampled in here were affected by coal bleaching as a result of the big La Nina event. And I think the main factors that happens are we get setbacks in growth due to coal bleaching, like that x-ray print I showed you earlier. <coughs> and Neil Canton has sort of demonstrated it takes about four years for parietes to recover. And also corals just getting outside of their comfort zone, that normal temperature range. We can also look at river flood events. Now this mainly affects inshore reefs of the Great Barrier Reef, but in really big flood events like 2011, 1991, 1974, that fresh water and whatever may be in it can get out to mid-shelf reefs as far as 60 kilometres offshore. And it's probably more of a surprise to them than it is to the inshore reefs. And we do this using luminescent lines in coral skeletons. So the inshore corals, we just put them in, under an ultraviolet, a disco light, and the very bright luminescent lines are big river flood events. And that's 1991 there. Then we have a series of dry years. So they're very faint bands. And we've been able to use this to reconstruct the Burdekin River flow back to the 1640s, which is more than triple the length of the instrumental gauged river record. And what we see when we look at that is these extreme events seem to be happening more frequently and becoming more extreme. And also that the fresh water is getting out to those mid-shelf reefs more frequently than it did in the past. Now this matches up with the idea of what might happen as the world continues to warm, because if you think about it, we're warming the atmosphere, it can hold more moisture. So for a given weather event, that causes a lot of rainfall, there's the potential to have more rainfall now than you did, say, 50 or 100 years ago. And it's nicely summed up by Kevin Trenbuth, is that the environment in which all weather events is not, not what it used to be. And people actually demonstrated, for those of you who remember the floods in Brisbane in 2011 and throughout large parts of Queensland, Using modelling studies, they've demonstrated that that amount of flooding would not have happened without the warmer sea surface temperatures. We can also sample the coral skeleton. It's made up of calcium carbonate, and there's a whole range of materials. We can use the stable oxygen isotope to measure temperature and salinity. Strontium to calcium ratio is a good measure of water temperature. Barium to calcium can tell you something about sediment inputs, and... Uh, boron isotopes about pH. And we can also look at pollution. And an example of this is from, these are coral reefs, uh, coral sampled in the Caribbean. And it's a, the amount, trace amount of lead measured in the coral skeleton. What we see is a rise in that over the 20th century and then a decline. That corresponds to the rise of the American automobile industry and then the change to unleaded petrol. And people have looked at this in coral reefs in different parts of the Indian Ocean, for example, where the change has happened at different times. It's not telling you anything about impacts, but it is telling you, importantly, that enough lead was produced to get into the atmosphere, end up in the oceans, and then end up in the coral skeletons. So they are uh, wonderful history books of the marine environment. This is a pub publication from about three years ago where they combined reconstructions of sea surface temperature from coral records from the various tropical ocean regions. So that's shown here. It's all scaled to the 1961 to 1990 average conditions to make things comparable. And overlaid in black is the instrumental observational record. 
So that just shows you how dramatically water temperatures on reefs have changed over the past several centuries. And 1998 and 2016 were the warmest years in at least the past 400 years for the tropical oceans. So coral reef history books, they tell us about long-term growth rates and we see evidence for recent slowing. We see growth hiatuses due to stress and this appears to be a relatively recent phenomenon when we look back several centuries. In terms of fresh water for the Great Barrier Reef, we're seeing bigger floods extending further out from land, clear recent warming signal, and also information about various other components of the marine environment. So going back to coral bleaching, it's been well documented. This is a comparison of the 1998, 2002 and 2016 bleaching events that Terry will have told you all about and the close match with the sea surface temperature series. One of the reasons there wasn't so much bleaching in the central Great Barrier Reef and southern Great Barrier Reef in 2016 was tropical cyclone Winston. And there was a grand irony because Fiji was the first country to, to ratify the Paris Agreement. A few weeks later, it got hit by tropical cyclone Winston we actually benefited from that because that weather dis the tropical cyclone decayed, became a weather disturbance that drifted into the coral seas, sea and the, the, the winds and cloud helped cool the central and southern Great Barrier Reef. And then we have coral bleaching again in 2017. I put these pictures up because corals can actually look rather beautiful when they're <laughs> bleaching. Um, but yeah. The other thing is uh, the amount of thermal stress that's occurring on tropical coral reefs is increasing. This is from Terry's paper earlier this year showing the sites that have good robust bleaching records going back to about 1980 and bleaching that happened between 2015 and 2016. Along the bottom here, going back to 1871 through 2017, we have a measure of the thermal stress. It's sort of degree heating months index. So it's a cumulative over a summer season amount of thermal stress. And what we can see is it's a dramatic rise, and I think that's 1998, 2010, 2016. 2016 was the most extreme year on record. The other point to make here is this blip here is 1878. There was a major El Nino event, 1877 to 1878, that we know from various early documentary sources, particularly in South America. And we can see here that the level of thermal stress associated with a major El Nino event, this was a third of what was experienced in 2016. So in 2016, the degree heating months was 4.7. If we estimate what might happen into the future based on one and a half degrees warming, that would rise to 8.5 with two degrees, the main target of the Paris Agreement, it would be 14.6, and three degrees, which is what we're currently tracking, despite all our best pledges in Paris, would be 30.1. I can't see that that's tenable at all for coral reefs. We also know that the amount of hard coral cover on the reefs are very dynamic. This comes from AIM's long-term monitoring team going from 1985 to 2016. So across the length of the Great Barrier Reef, the 2,000 kilometres, there's different main drivers as to the major changes in the amount of hard coral cover. They're very dynamic systems. We are also now, uh, there's various papers defining when this might be happen, but uh, it's likely that they're going to declare a new geological era, which we're going to call the Anthropocene. And some of the measures of that is just the human impact on the environment and that's left uh, as recorded in the environment. In fact, the nuclear test spikes from the 50s and 60s are one of the measures that they used they're thinking about using to define when the Anthropocene starts because you can see that in a whole range of geological records. We also, another good measure is the uh, 
number of McDonald's restaurants, which I think is here, uh, which escalated since 1950. The human impact upon the planet is just phenomenal. One of the key issues which I referred to at the start is there is no clear end point at the moment. We can't say climate has changed and this is the new normal that we have to work with. Climate is going to continue to change till something drastic happens and we get our act together. And we're totally taking the corals outside of their comfort zone. This is from a paper from Ove Goldberg. This is where coral reefs have been happy in terms of temperature and carbon dioxide over hundreds of thousands of years in the geological record. I think his blue dot was when he published the paper about, uh, yeah, 11 years ago. No, it's more, yeah, so yeah, 11 years ago. We've moved since then already up to here. We're taking corals completely outside of their comfort zone. So, a change in climate for coral reefs. We know they're highly vulnerable, one of the most vulnerable ecosystems around. That's added to the ongoing local anthropogenic stresses. More intense cyclones, fewer but more intense, more physical destruction. Ocean acidification is likely to have a number of outcomes, but weaker skeletons is one of them. More extreme rainfall and river flood events. The connectivity between reefs is likely to change as the ocean circulation changes. And warming oceans result in bleaching diseases, reduced growth rates. They're going to, we're going to end up with much simpler ecosystems and obviously a reduction in the goods and services. So, saving coral reefs, plan A. This was a quarter of a century ago. Uh, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change said we were going to stabilise greenhouse gas concentrations to allow ecosystems to adapt naturally to climate change. And virtually every country signed up for this. And that didn't work, clearly. So, saving coral reefs, plan B. We all got very excited. 2015, carbon dioxide had just got up to just over 400 parts per million. Uh, we all agreed that we were going to keep global warming to less than 2 degrees and aspirationally below 1.5 degrees Celsius. You have to remember when you look at those values though that they include the warming that has already occurred to date. So basically you're talking about an extra half a degree or an extra one degree. So we're all very happy with that one. But there's several papers published, this is Freeler et al and Jean-Pierre Cattuso, that said even if you constrain it to one and a half degrees Celsius, coral reefs, warm water coral reefs are still going to be at high risk of degradation even with the low emission scenarios and this is just looking at degree heating weeks. And recent papers have suggested that we have a 1% chance of staying at 1.5 degrees Celsius global warming. That's not very bright. So, not happy about that. So, there's two plan C's, which is exploiting reefs that don't seem to be naturally resilient or resistant to, to uh, various thermal stress stresses and other things such as crown of thorn starfish. This is a, from a recent paper by Hock et al, where they found, I think it was about 100 source reefs on the Great Barrier Reef, which seemed to be resistant to these stresses, but had also the potential to provide larvae to the other reefs. There's also the 50 Reefs Initiative, that Ho Goldberg's leading, saying, can we find 50 reefs around the world, which maybe we've got a chance of uh, sustaining into the future. So I think that's worth thinking about. And Saving Coral Reefs, Plan D, is active intervention, which is seriously being discussed now. People are exploiting it. Uh, Madeleine Van Oppen at Ames and the University of Hawaii are collaborating on looking at assisted evolution, accelerating the natural the evolutionary processes in the, in the corals and or the uh, symbiodinium, assisted gene flow, help them migrate. Uh, a big initiative that AIMS in, is involved in at the moment is about reef restoration and can you farm things, thermally tolerant corals, on a scale that would be relevant to the Great Barrier Reef. So 
basically at the moment it's, it's an R&D project. Could you actually do that at the scale that is necessary? And I think you've heard recently uh, about Clyde Broutning, some actual geoengineering projects. So again, I think that's something that you, we all have to think about. Uh, we can't just assume that a bit of good management is going to solve all the problems. There's, there's going to be a need for active interventions. Oops. So, bottom line is coral reefs matter, but time is of the essence, and having been blaring on about climate change for 35 years, uh, <laughs> time really is of the essence. Uh, the world is changing. We are changing our relationship with energy, which is really good. This is a lovely example from China. It's a lake covered in solar panels. That lake used to be a coal mine and they flooded it and it just floated solar panels on it. Uh, people are moving, finding other things that we can use instead of plastics, which is another real problem. But I would also conclude that all the actions that we take to deal with climate change are actions we should be taking anyway. Regard if climate change wasn't happening, we have to look after our planet much better than we have been in the past. And I'll finish there.